Aloha, welcome to Kokua Hawaii Foundation's Aina Cooking for Change, a virtual family cooking series hosted by Chef Ed Kenny, Kokua Hawaii Foundation board member and co-owner of Town Hospitality Group. Kicking off our first Aina Cooking for Change session will be Dave Caldiero and his daughter Opal, who will be cooking pesto linguine with ulu and green beans and a simple vinaigrette. Please use the chat box and tell us how many family members you are cooking with today, what city or even state you're tuning in from, and why you love Ulu. This Zoom webinar will be in presenter mode only, so the presenters will have video and audio capabilities only. One way for participants to interact with Chef Dave throughout the session is to use the chat or Q&A boxes. Kokua Hawaii Foundation staff will be monitoring both. So please drop your questions and comments to Dave there and we'll share them throughout the webinar. This webinar will be recorded and available to view after the live Zoom on Kokua Hawaii Foundation's website. Details will be sent to the participants in a wrap up email. Thank you all so much for joining us. And now let's start cooking for change. Happy National Farm to School Month. I'm Ed Kenny, chef owner of Town Hospitality Group and proud member of the board of directors of Kokua Hawaii Foundation, which is really the reason we're all here together today. Thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning into our first inaugural Aina Cooking for Change. Um, Farm to School Month, I think I can speak for myself and my chef colleagues that we all anxiously await this month every year. Kokua Hawaii Foundation and Aina in Schools always call, up it, call us up and say, okay, what school do you wanna go to? And I usually go to Wailai School or Waikiki School, somewhere in our community. And I gotta tell you, there is nothing more meaningful than going to these schools, working in the gardens with the kids, cooking with them. The, the, the light bulb revelatory moments that I have with these kids, I will keep with me forever. You know, like we'll dump flour on a table with eggs and we'll make pasta and we'll crank pasta noodles and it blows their minds. Or, or we'll take basil that they grew in their garden and we'll throw it into a mortar and pestle and garlic and cheese and olive oil and I let them bash it up. And before they know it, they have pesto with that, with, with that pasta. And to me, it is definitely one of the highlights every year. Um, unfortunately, this year, things have changed. We haven't been able to go to schools. So that's why we're here today. Where are we actually? Well, here we are in my backyard. I'm sitting under this beautiful green leafed tree. Who knows what kind of tree this is? You in the back. No, nope, not mango. You? No, no, not that. Ulu, you're right. It's ulu, also known as breadfruit. This is one of three native st starch staples in Hawaii. We have ulu. We have kalo or taro and uwala and sweet potato. You know what the two most consumed starches are in Hawaii? You got it, rice and wheat or pasta and bread. Why is it that we have to bring in pasta and bread and rice from thousands of miles away when we have one of the most delicious foodstuffs right under our nose? Let me show you a little bit about these foods that I just picked. You can eat it in three stages, three ways. Little baby ulu is just like artichoke hearts when it's steamed. My favorite way is kind of just firm, ripe and firm, but not yet soft. It's starchy like a potato. And then when it gets really ripe and mushy like this, look, it's almost just like a custard on the inside. It's sweet. It's got this really tropical banana kind of thing going on. 100% of this fruit or vegetable is eat edible. So, I mean, you can eat it from the seeds to the core of the skin. This could potentially feed the world. You look at me and say, what am I gonna do with Ulu? Well, you came to the right place. In the next four weeks, you are going to work with some of the best chefs in Honolulu, cook at home with your family, 
with products that have been grown at the Kokua Aina Learning Farm at maybe your school garden, hopefully even your own backyard, and you will have Hulu on every single one of them. So I guess without any further ado, it's time for me to introduce an extremely talented chef, my business partner, Dave Caldiero, who is going to make a traditional Italian dish for you using Hawaiian Hulu. Aloha. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, signing up for the first uh, Ina in Schools virtual Zoom cooking class. Uh, this is my daughter, Opal. Hi. She uh, went to Waikiki Elementary School, which is uh, just around the corner from us and has one of the, one of the best um, farm to school gardens. Um, we at the restaurant at town have the opportunity to use a lot of the ingredients that they grow. Um, we are, this is some of the stuff that we got from our got from the Waikiki garden yesterday. We're gonna be using some of them in our recipes today. Um, we have uh, some basil from, uh, from Waikiki school. We also got some basil from the, uh, the uh, Kokua um, Aina Garden as well. I think some of you guys got uh, some basil from Ma'o Farm as well in your bags. A lot of the ulu also came from Ma'o Farm. Um, and as uh, Ed was saying, uh, the three different kind of ripenesses of the ulu, if all goes well, all of you got kind of that middle uh, ripeness of ulu, which is to be treated more like a potato which is why we chose to do these recipes for you. So the uh, couple recipes we're gonna be working on are a very simple vinaigrette, and that's just to kind of go along with the vegetables that hopefully round up your meal. Um, the ulu that we're using is gonna be used in a dish that's traditionally, uh, we use potatoes. There's a dish out of uh, Genoa, Italy, that uses pesto, which is kind of the home of where pesto came from. Um, and it's linguine with potatoes and green beans and uh, basil pesto. So we've decided to use the ulu in place of the potatoes in that dish. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure most of the ulu that ma'o grows is a, a variety called ma'afala, which is one of the ones that we find to be uh, the best to use for this, this starchy potato um, uh, recipes. Um, the exciting stuff that you guys get to use in all of the different uh, grade levels that we're using, the green beans, um, they're used in a few of the different uh, grade levels from the seeding um, to uh, the three sisters. Um, do you remember the three, the three sisters in school? Yeah, actually, in my grade, we, it, my three sisters didn't actually work out very well, so we ended up helping the younger kids with the three sisters. So that was really fun, and I, that's kind of one of my main memories. Of, of the three sisters. Awesome. Yeah. Do, you, do you have any other memories of the, of the INA program in school? Um, I remember working with the pollinators. We, um, <laughs> we worked with butterflies. We hatched and released them. It was super fun. We did that in kindergarten. Cool. Uh, so we'd, we'd like to get started into some of the recipes. Um, this is a really great opportunity for us and uh, we, tell you, like Ed was saying, every year we really look forward to going to the schools to do these classes. This is kind of um, a, an interesting situation for me to just be talking to a camera. I really always enjoy the, the eyes and the oohs and the ahs of the kids as we take out some of these vegetables and get to uh, share them and taste them and smell them. Um, so um, we're going to do our best 
and hope that you guys can smell and taste everything through the camera. Um, if you're cooking along uh, with us, maybe take this opportunity to do a quick wash on your hands. Um, if you haven't washed your basil and green beans, um, please do so all, as well, um, just to be safe. We've been waiting for, for all you guys to tune in, so we're all scrubbed up and ready to go. Um, and I'm pretty sure this mode is a presentation mode of Zoom. So um, I, think, I think all you guys can see are the two camera views. Uh, we're gonna do our best to kind of speak to you through this uh, camera and then the uh, side camera will be used for uh, hopefully getting a better angle on what's going on on the cutting board um, and on the, on the table here. So um, the first recipe we're gonna start on and this is gonna all kind of hopefully come together into the one meal of salad and pasta is going to be a really basic uh, vinaigrette. So the things that we like to use in a vinaigrette uh, this is not from the school garden, unfortunately. These are uh, shallots. Uh, this is this is kind of what it looks like in its whole. It's in the onion family, um, and it really creates a lot of flavor in in, uh, in our uh, vinaigrettes. But before we put them in the in the in the oil, we like to dice it up. Like so. And this, this uh, dressing can be used with any real any uh, vinegar. We choose to use white balsamic vinegar. I think it's a, a nice balance of sweet and sour, but, but any vinegars will do. So for the, for the next 10 minutes or so, while we're working on our next recipe, I'm just gonna take these shallots and put them in the, in the vinegar. And uh, the vinegar is gonna kind of help to soften the shallots and cook them a little bit and uh, make them a little less sharp. If you guys have eaten uh, onions raw, sometimes they have a real strong flavor. Uh, the vinegar is, is gonna help to kind of soften those flavors. And I like to use a mason jar when making vinaigrettes because once we add the rest of the ingredients, we can just put the lid back on and shake it up and we, and we have our vinaigrette all, already done. So in the meantime, while these uh, shallots are cooking in the vinegar, we're going to start on our pesto. You want to start on the pesto? Sure. Okay. So this is this uh, is called a mortar and pesto, which kind of is what uh, gives pesto its name. I imagine some of you have already had the pesto in some of the uh, restaurants and things that you you've eaten in with your family or possibly even in uh, in other uh, school programs. Um, this is what gives pesto its name. And originally it was used, you would use the pesto to crush or, uh, or uh, smash the, the ingredients in the pesto. And that's what gives the pesto its name. So in this bowl, as you can see here, we have a couple of cloves of garlic. We're gonna add a pinch of salt. And the salt is, is gonna be what kind of uh, gives the uh, some, uh, uh, like almost like sandpaper for the garlic so that it crushes it up. I'm going to start by squishing it in with the salt. Um, if by chance you don't have a mortar and pestle on that recipe that was uh, emailed along to you, to you guys, um, you can also use a food processor, um, a blender would do, anything really would work. Um, as long as you can smash up the ingredients and blend them all together. And keep moving it around to get all the salt. There you go. Uh, if you are using a mortar and pestle, uh, make sure you kind of real, really scrape it and scratch it along the bottom of the bowl. Once you have the garlic into a paste, there you go. Flip the paste and show the camera here. Can you guys see that paste? There we go. Once you have the, the garlic and salt into a paste, we're gonna add the pine nuts. Um, pine nuts are actually not a nut, it's a seed, believe it or not, and it comes out of uh, what looks like a pine cone. It's the seed from inside of a pine cone, so a lot of people that are even allergic to nuts are not allergic to pine nuts. Um, if by chance you don't have pine nuts, uh, you could use walnuts, or uh, I've even seen people use pecans, um, anything that's nice and fatty. One of the important things about making pesto is to make sure that your uh, nuts are raw, not toasted. 
if they're toasted ahead of time, the, the uh, oil doesn't get as, as mushy in there. And you want some nice, nice oil. So yeah, give that a smash. There you go. Alex, are there any questions coming through in the chat that we need to address? Not yet. Cool. Well, that's good. How are you doing now? Good. So what, what I remember when Opal was in school, we learned a bit about how, the, how um, I forget which grade level it was, but they used basil as part of one of the uh, buddy planting systems. And basil um, helps to keep the, they plant it along with the tomatoes. So that helped the bee, the fragrance of the basil helps to keep the pests away from the tomato plants. And there's a lot of those kind of connections between the two different plants that you, uh, if you have the opportunity, um, you'll learn in uh, some of the INA curriculum where even the green beans are part of a, a buddy program with the carrots, I believe, because um, beans are, provide nitrogen for the soil, which is good for the carrots to grow in. So the, Carrots uh, suck up the, the uh, nutrients of the, the green bean plants, so they plant them side by side and they work together. There you go. I'm gonna give it a shot. You're on getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> so once you get all the, the pine nuts all mashed up, we're gonna add the pesto, the yeah, basil. One of the things um, I think from uh, buying pesto in the store, um, I think. What normally you see in the store is a little bit more oily than the traditional uh, Ligurian or Genovese uh, pesto. It usually, um, what we see in the supermarkets here is, has, is more liquidy. In Italy, the pesto is usually a bit more white and thick because they use a lot of uh, cheese and nuts in there. And the raw nuts really is what helps make, that, make the pesto nice and fatty. This is always fun. When we used to do this uh, this demonstration at Waikiki, or like Ed said, we've done it at Wildlife Charter School as well. Um, we would have a bunch, a few of these different mortars, and give them all out to different groups. And I, I always found it interesting that you can put the same four or five ingredients in a bowl and wind up with completely different products in the end, just because of all of the the way that the different kids. Uh, we're mashing it up and also the different mortars and pestles they make a different kind of all make a different product someone's asking if you can use the stems of the basil um it's not uh to use the stem of a basil sorry we just got a question in the chat to ask if they can if we can use the stem of the basil i like to reserve the stems of the basil to season uh soups and sauces but I wouldn't use it for the uh, pesto. It's going to be really difficult to, um, to get the, the stem to break down and mash up. You want to use just the leaves. Maybe the soft parts of the stem, right where it comes into the leaf, but not, uh, not, the, big, not the big stem. Whenever you're making like tomato sauce or say a soup, it's nice to save those stems and maybe tie them up and put them in the soup and then you can take them out and you have a nice basil flavor in your uh, tomato sauce or in your soup when you're done. Okay, so the pest, can you, can you guys see what's going on in the bowl here? So at this point, we've still haven't added any, anything other than the garlic, the nuts and the basil. Um, and the reason is we are gonna be adding some olive oil, but if you add the olive oil too soon, it makes it soupy and, and you can't really mash up the, the, the basil in there. So you want to wait to the end to, and then we'll slowly add the, the uh, olive oil. So now that the, the basil is kind of starting to uh, turn into a mash, we're going to add some of the Parmesan cheese. This is already grated Parmesan cheese. Any kind of uh, salty, hard cheese would work. A lot of people like to use pecorino cheese as well. Um, they're, they're from two different animals. Parmesan cheese comes from a cow and pecorino comes from a sheep. Both real good uh, salty cheeses. Um, I, I prefer Parmesan cheese for, for pestos. All right, we're getting that. Good? Okay, let me finish it up. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, on, for this recipe, and you know, I for for what we send out, I I put two cloves of garlic, a cup of pine nuts, two cups of basil, and about a cup of Parmesan cheese, and then the olive oil. Although I think the recipe has listed about a cup, I don't want you to add the whole cup because what you what we're going to do is reserve some of that olive oil. And um, the olive oil is good to, if we don't use all the pesto for the pasta, what you want to, when you keep the pesto, we're going to pour a little bit of, of uh, olive oil over the top and it's going to keep it from uh, turning a, a funny color in the refrigerator. So while Opal's finishing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this pasta in the water. So we're using linguine, but going back to the recipe, you guys can use whatever you have in the house. It doesn't have to be linguine. It could be another long pasta or a short pasta. Um, as far as the pesto goes, if you, if you don't wanna have uh, so much basil and you wanna maybe add another herb in there, you can put parsley or oregano. Um, I wouldn't put any like real firm herbs like rosemary or any of that stuff. It's kind of can get kind of strong. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put this pasta in the water. How are you doing over there? Okay. Right. So now that uh, the pesto is all mashed up. We're going to add a little bit of the olive oil. Okay, so while Opal's finishing the pesto, I'm going to finish up the dressing. So this was this is uh, one quarter of a cup of white balsamic vinegar and one, one fourth of the recipe is going to be vinegar and the other three quarters is going to be olive oil. And that is the base for any simple vinegar. One part vinegar to three parts olive oil. So we have, like I said, the one quarter cup of uh, vinegar, some shallot, I'm gonna put some cracked pepper you guys see pepper. Okay. A little bit of salt. And this is a Dijon mustard. I like to put just a small little spoonful of Dijon in there. And then this is three quarters of a cup of extra virgin olive oil. I'm going to add all that to the jar. And put the lid on. Okay, and shake away. And that's going to be our dressing. There you go. That's good, Opie. Okay. So here we have our pesto. And like I said, this is going to be unlike probably what you guys have seen in the supermarkets. This is kind of like how, how, how grandma would make instead of how they made in a, in a machine. Can you guys see that? There you go. All right, let's check on our pasta. So the pasta usually cooks for about 10 or 12 minutes. And we went ahead before, before we signed on and we took all the little tips off of the green beans. So right now all we have are, are uh, clean, washed, and stemmed green beans. And you only need to do the top side of the green beans where they cut where they attach to the plant. The other side is completely edible. And then on that recipe as well should have been uh, the process for uh, the ulu. Um, usually what we do is uh, peel the ulu, take the center out after you cut it, chunk it up into pieces like this size. Can you see that? And then I add it to, I put cold water and I bring it up to a boil. Once it comes to a boil, we turn it off. And then I take it out. So now this ulu can be eaten just like this. 
But what we're going to do in the last moment or so, we're going to add it to the pasta water, just so the green beans and the blue all get hot together again, and we'll and we'll uh, finish it up with the pesto. Do you ever remember we re made pesto with pasta? Um, I know we made it. We made mozzarella one year. Yeah, and how many? How many we made we? pesto. I know we've done it with with uh, a few of the classes. I know Uncle Eddie and I have done it. Um, while while we're waiting for the pasta to to, uh, to cook, this this when Scott from Waikiki Elementary School came to the restaurant yesterday, I was in awe of some of these vegetables. Um, mostly because you guys that are here in Hawaii right now know how hot it has been over these last couple of days or a week or so, and for vegetables to be this crispy and green. I mean, look at how beautiful. This is tot soy. Um, it's kind of like an Asian spinach. And the fact that he, we're able to get such nice, uh, crispy vegetables, this is manoa lettuce. Um, this, I mean, look at all the, the basil we got from him is gorgeous. This is uh, like a bok choy, so crispy and nice. Cool, yeah? We got some mizuna, some garlic chives, um, we're going to put all, a bunch of this stuff in our salad. We have lacanado kale and some uh, chard. Okay. Exciting stuff. We feel real lucky to, to be able to work with Waikiki School on some of the things that they grow. All right, so the pasta just got ready. And then please don't forget, as we're rounding up the recipes, if you guys have any questions, um, write it into the uh, chat boxes and comments. I'm not sure if there's another opportunity. You choose all panelists. Oh, okay. And then you can you choose all panelists. Okay. And, what? and attendees. And attendees. And attendees. I'm sorry, all panelists and attendees. And this way you can write into the chat that way. Okay, so our pasta is just about cooked. I'm going to give one a check. You want to try it open? It's hot. <laughs> Almost there? Okay, so now that the pasta is just about cooked, I'm going to add the green beans to the water and let those cook for a minute. Dave, is it okay to use the flowering parts of the basil in the pesto? Yes, it, it's fine to use those. If they actually have like the white flowers, a little, uh, I would say maybe take some of those out. Um, but where, like, for instance, um, this is fine to use the whole thing. It's actually kind of a little sweet and, and quite floral. Okay. And then do, does the ulu and green beans cook for the same amount of time in the pasta water? Um, so the, since the ulu is already cooked, we just want that to be hot. So I'm only going to add that right before we strain it. The green beans take about one minute, and the pasta takes about 12 minutes. So if we do some math, we start the pasta, we wait about 11 minutes, add the, the green beans, and then right as we're about to strain it, we're going to add the, the ulu. And the same thing would go if you by chance somewhere else where you don't have ulu, hopefully everyone does, um, and if not, one day we will. Um, and if you're using potatoes, the same rules apply. Um, you can cut up the potatoes and cook them, as I said. And then uh, right as we're about to strain the pasta, you can throw the potatoes in as well. This is a great pasta for, for lunchtime or especially like a hot day like this. The pesto is a great, a great uh, pasta preparation. All right. Just about there. Green beans. So now I'm going to add the ulu. Okay, I'm going to go that way with the top. And that's just to get it hot. Usually at this point, there's like some screaming children all ready to eat and taste some of the food. So if Alex, Obi, if you guys don't mind, start making a lot of noise and get excited about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're so hungry. <laughs> it's awesome. We have 
have some people on this webinar from Molokai. I see some from Kaneohe. Uh, right on. Awesome. I think some of my friends, Ane and Kama and the kids are all signing in from Molokai. Really stoked that you guys are all tuned in for this. Appreciate it. Okay, so we're going to just use this bowl now to mix our pasta. Uh, one of the things that I, I do is, um, I don't know if you guys can see this, but let's try this. I'm going to turn this real fast. So when I strain the pasta, I try to put the strainer back inside the pot. And the reason I do that is I try to save some of the pasta water. The pasta water is going to be what makes uh, the sauce really yummy and, and kind of rich in the end. So we're going to take all this good stuff, pop it in the bowl. Take some of our pesto. Pop that in there. Add a little bit of pasta water. Hopefully you guys can see all this. And then a little bit more Parmesan cheese. And some olive oil. And then mix it up. Someone is asking if they're using boiled potatoes, how to keep them from browning because they're not going to make the pasta until later tonight. Mm -hmm. once, the, once the potatoes are boiled, they shouldn't turn brown. Um, if you if they're still raw, then just make sure you keep them in, in water and that's what will uh, keep them from turning brown. And then a little bit, a little bit of salt. But this uh, salt is actually from those people from Molokai that are tuning in. Thank you. Okay, so here we have our linguine with Genovese basil. I still, you guys see this in this camera? Mm, right now? Just a little bit. Okay, let me, let me come back. So you can see it's pretty creamy and not so green and oily. And that's, I think, you know, probably, like I said, a little bit what's going to be, uh, be different about the store-bought pesto versus what you're going to hopefully make in your kitchens today. Um, I like to add a little bit more Parmesan cheese, freshly grated on top. And this, this amount, I think we did about a half a pound of pasta, a cup of ulu. Um, and a handful of green beans. So probably feed about two or three people. Um, one pound of pasta, I usually account for about five um, adults. So maybe if you're, if you guys are cooking for, uh, you know, only three people, so I think a half a pound should be good. And then this is, um, like I said, we just made a sim real simple salad. Uh, this has some of the manoa lettuce, the mizuna. This is, um, like an edible hibiscus or sorrel. Um, and then we have some tomatoes from Whole Farms in there. Um, I think we I should mention, where do we get the green beans from? Oh, Alun, we got the green beans from Alun Farms. So everything in that, uh, in that pasta dish with the exception of the pasta, like uh, Ed said, is uh, unfortunately imported. But this, this uh, dish or this uh, meal in its entirety um, if you guys look onto your uh, Kukua food guide, I'm a food guide, and you'll realize that everything kind of has a, comes a, from a, a spot on there. So um, the energy foods, we have the, the pasta and the ulu. The bodybuilding foods would be the uh, green beans and basil. Uh, brain foods, we have the pine nuts and the olive oil. And, I'm sorry, the protected foods are the basil and the green beans. And then some of the salad just kind of help helps to round up the rest of our the rest of our meal. I'm just gonna simply dress that. And like I said, this dressing will work with just about any salad. Um, it's the vinegar. The vinegar in there is a nice, nice sweet dressing. And that's it. That's it. Did I go too fast? Alex? No, that's great. Okay. Always salt your salads. That's key. 
Thank you guys. Do we have any other questions or comments on the uh, chat? And if not, uh, hit us up now is a good time to do that. Alex is typing away feverishly right now. No questions so far, but if you have any, let us know. Oh, how long will this recipe last in the refrigerator? Mm -hmm. Okay, so good question. The pesto, as I was saying, um, if we have, do I have another jar here? Let's see. So, for the pesto, whatever you have left of the pesto, um, if you put it in a, in a jar or a, you know, a bowl of some sort or anything you can put in the fridge, once you get in there, um, you're going to just top it with a little bit more olive oil. And to tell you the truth, once you have that coating of olive oil on the top, you could probably keep it a month in the refrigerator before it'll start to turn and oxidize and change uh, color. Um, and take the, the ulu, you could boil ahead and that probably could stay in the refrigerator a few days. Um, once you mix it, I would say you should want to eat it for green cold pasta the next day is one of Opal's favorites. <laughs> um, what other dishes can you use the pesto for? Ooh, a laundry list of things pesto could be used for. Um, Obo really likes it on uh, bagels, um, on avocado. Um, we use it at the restaurant a lot to um, use as like a, a top, like you probably may have heard the term a tapenade, where you would like spread it on top of a piece of bread, or it could be a dip next to some cheese and salamis. Um, Pesto uh, could really be used for, for a lot of different different things. It could, I mean, you could loosen it up and even turn it into a dressing for a, a salad or some other vegetables. Um, actually, the pesto on just on green beans and and ulu is a really nice kind of a, a room temperature salad as well. Right. Um. Let's see. Someone is asking where can people buy ulu. Hmm. So other than going to the farmer's market, like right now is a great time to go to the, uh, I know Ma'o has uh, ulu abundantly. Um, a lot of different farmers, if you uh, reach out to them on their web pages or Instagram, I uh, sell out of the farm. I know uh, Dean Wilhelm has in, at his farm. Um, occasionally I have seen ulu at some of the food lands. Um, they'll sell they'll sell it sometimes and once in a while at Whole Foods, but I would say your best bet is probably um, the farmer's market. I know Ma'o goes to the Kakako one on Saturdays um, and they have been abundantly uh, available in the, in the recent weeks. And when we first uh, opened the restaurant 15 years ago, it was really hard to find Ulu regularly and um, since the um, Ulu Co-op has opened and a few other organizations have come together to uh, really try to push Ulu production. Um, it's available more and more and um, now I feel like you can almost get it um, any any season of the year. Um, so what is wondering if you could go over the dressing recipe again. The, put it, the, the amount? Yep. So um, the dressing is like I said one quarter vinegar so in this case, our total, the total volume of our dressing is one cup. So we did one quarter cup vinegar, about two tablespoons of chopped shallot, a teaspoon of Dijon mustard, and then three quarters of a cup of olive oil. Um, I like to use good extra virgin olive oil. It's not 100% necessary. You could use any type of olive oil or oil that you're comfortable with, but that same ratio is best. So if you choose to use avocado oil or something else, um, still stick with a one part vinegar to three parts um, oil. And salt and pepper is important. And then someone asked, how long did you cook the ulu? Um, so if, uh, most of the ulu that we choose in that variety, that uh, that doneness, like you know, Ed was saying, when they're small and underripe, uh, they need to be cooked for quite some time. When they're overripe, you can eat them straight off the tree. Uh, when they're when they're the ripeness, that we choose to use it more like a potato, 
Um, it's really, I mean, it's edible as it is, but we find that all it really needs to do is be hydrated. So you can steam it for a few minutes, or I find that my favorite way to do it is put, chop up the ulu in whatever size piece that you, you want for whatever recipe you're using it for. Put it in cold salted water, um, bring the water up to a boil. Once the water begins to boil, just turn off the pot and let it sit. And you'll see when you first put the ulu in the cold water, it'll be floating. Well, all the different when it starts to boil, um, you'll see some of them start to change to a, diff a slightly darker color. Then when you turn it off, all the ulu will begin to sink. Once it all sinks, then it's fully hydrated and it becomes delicious, right, like that. Awesome. And even if you were to want it to maybe try to fry the ulu or bake it after that, I would still go through that process first. Um, and it just makes the ulu more moist and, uh, and yummy. Sometimes if you try to just fry it straight, you wind up with more like uh, ulu chips rather than kind of like, uh, like, fried, like French fried potatoes. And then someone's wondering, did you rinse your pasta or did you just strain it and keep some of the pasta water? Um, I just strained it and I kept some of the pasta water. Uh, you want all that starch from the pasta to remain in the dish. Uh, that's going to be part of what makes the sauce. So it's the combination of the basil pesto, the olive oil, and the pasta water, which has the starch from the noodles in it that makes that nice kind of creamy sauce. And obviously the Parmesan cheese as well. Yeah, some restaurants keep their pasta water uh, a little bit of their pasta water from the day before to start their pasta water the next day because it had they want that starch to be in the water. It's really what provides for a good sauce. Great, and someone's asking, maybe not in this recipe, what, what is mise en place? Huh. Interesting question. Uh, mise en place means um, things in their place, and it's a French term used in um, traditional restaurants. Uh, to mean that you're ready to cook. So for instance, um, before you guys signed on, um, I prepped out everything and had it kind of ready so that I didn't have to run around once you guys sign on. It's all my things are in place. So mise en place. Interesting question. Thank you. <laughs> Where's that, Mark and Gucci? <laughs> All right, everyone's saying they love to make this meal with the family and they're so excited. Awesome. So cool. thank you, everyone. Thank you guys all for uh, supporting this program and to Kim and Jack and everyone else at Kukua. Um, this has been a great opportunity for all of us chefs to continue our outreach. Um, it's really meaningful for us to uh, not only be able to get to uh, cook with the kids, but it's great, especially in our cooking in our neighborhoods and then have the opportunity to have some of them come into the restaurants and see their see their how excited they are to see us cooking in the environment and i know um, in the past we've had some um uh, you know field trips and stuff to the restaurant where they get to see how a restaurant works um hopefully one day we can really get back to all that um it's really uh, uh sad to drive by white elementary school and not see all the kids running around on the on the grass and playing in the garden. Um, I, I can't wait for those days again. Um, and then uh, please um, also don't forget to uh, sign up for the next three sessions. I think next week is uh, Chef Mark Noguchi doing some ulu fries, and um, and uh, and the weeks after that are going to be great as well. So please tune in for all of these. Thanks for taking the time on a Sunday to do so. I hope you guys all get a chance to, for those of you that weren't cooking along, um, I hope you guys get the chance to use the ingredients uh, that was provided for you for dinner tonight. And um, cheers to you guys for uh, tuning in. All right, one last question. What is the best way to keep basil fresh? Ooh, um, so basil, it, this is a tricky thing. Um, unfortunately, the more organic and fresh the basil is, the shorter the shelf life uh, tends to be in the refrigerator. So that usually is a good indicator of how well your basil was grown. Once you pick it, you really should try to use it as quick as you can. 
But if you must keep it for a while, I recommend putting it in like a tall, like a glass with just a really bit of a small bit of water in the bottom so that the stems can stay hydrated and a damp paper towel over the top. Um, if you don't have the ability to stand something up in the refrigerator, I would say maybe rolling it up inside some damp um, paper towels or something or a damp uh, rag is probably the best way to keep it. Um, not too wet because then it will definitely kind of wilt as well. Thank you guys. Opie, you have anything to close with? Um, <laughs> have a great rest of your day, guys. <laughs> Thank you guys. Hoi ho. Thanks for joining.